Um, and I was told to file a notice of intent to include it with my RV notice of intent. So I'm, I'm spending a lot of money here. I think that they are trying to um, just make me submit to them and, um, you know, maybe drop the hearing and, and just not be able to use my land or not be able to put my docs out. Uh, very frustrating. I, I do have um, my close friend, Rob Baranowski. He's on the call also. Um, he might want to speak on my behalf or about the property or about the way I've, I've personally been treated by conservation members on the hearings. Uh, I believe they, they haven't treated me in a professional manner. Uh, there's been some um, outlandish statements and comments said and um, I, I believe there's some conflicts of interest and there's some hang, anger and, and hate towards me. And I still can't figure out why um, that I'm going through the stuff that I've been going through. The Conservation Commission wants to come visit my property once again. This will be for the third time. Uh, they visited once with me on property and then they visited a second time uh, without my, without my uh, notice. They didn't go on the property. They looked over the fence, but um, we asked them two weeks in advance, or we asked them two weeks ago um, that we would we, we would be available for a walkthrough in the property again, and it kind of fell on deaf ears. And um, they were actually out in my neighborhood in that area uh, one day last week and didn't contact me or, or, or schedule anything. And they were out walking sites of other people that had applied for um, camper permits and dock permits way right. after the fact. I just got to have you wrap it up real quick, though. Could I, yeah, could no I just problem. ask, Mark, could I just ask you if you would please, um, could you possibly put some of this in writing to us and submit it to the select board? Uh, we're trying to gather information uh, for our future use. Um, so if you could put that in writing, if you wouldn't mind, I would, I would really appreciate it. Yes, Joyce, and it should be in your inbox. Um, I was just going out off of what I what I actually wrote to Select Board. I sent it to the info address of Select Board. Um, okay. So you guys should be should be getting that. Okay, that's so like great. I said, just 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 very frustrating. My father, my uh, my father's retired. Uh, he had a stroke, and he uses the property. I have friends and family that use it, and it's it's really stressful. Yeah, yep. you know. I, I'm being put through this. Yeah. The Conservation Commission, I'm just going to make a, a blank statement here. They are supposed to be helpful to our citizens, not hurtful. So that's all I'm going to say for tonight. And I will read you what you put in my inbox. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mark. And uh, yeah, Rob, you have your camera on. Oh, John, did you have something? Yeah. I watched two of their complete meetings and I watched bits of a few of their and uh, they got some issues on that board, sure. So, yeah, well, John, I think the next step we need to I want um, to gather information, I want people to send us whatever they have, and I think we need to uh, make some type of determination uh, within the next couple of weeks of what we're going to do. You know, it seems like there's a lot of ideas there, and there's five people on our board, and there's seven people on that board. Yeah. And I'd like to see maybe that board go down to five. Yeah, uh, I think so, too. I'm with you on that. We can move things along a little bit quicker. And Hey, John, I agree with you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Rob, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I, um, Mark kind of summed it up. Uh, it, it just seems like every time we go to these meetings, as Mark mentioned, we're going to be going before them the fourth time um, in two weeks. Uh, so every time, that's another two-week delay. And then even after you get the final permit, they have to go through a 10-day waiting period. So now we're looking at something we started in early April, looking at mid-June before we can even attempt to put something in if it gets approved. Um I personally, after the last meeting two weeks ago, they had mentioned wanting to mark out the 100-foot uh, annual mean water line. I did it. The next day, I called Janice on the phone, left her a message saying, hey, I'm here. If you want to come up, 
I left my phone number and said, just come up and see it if you want to do it. And then it was the next meeting. They're like, well, you know, we had other things to do. We had, you know, we didn't have the time. We have a lot of permits. It's like, it just seems every single meeting is something else. And just, again, just the treatment, it was one minute, we're trying to write up these mitigation plans. And again, all we're asking to do is park a camper on land that's been developed for 25 years. Somebody puts in a concrete pavilion, they don't accept our mitigation plan, but they say, yeah, just go plant some blueberry bushes. Everybody loves blueberry bushes. So if you really look back at last night's meeting, I would encourage it. And you, you really can see the difference in treatment between the parties that are involved. They also closed a couple meetings last night, um, some requests for determinations, and they had actually some open items. And that is actually against Department of Environmental Protection. If you have open items from environmental species, they are not allowed to close the hearings. And yet last night they closed, I think five or six hearings, requests for determinations with open items, which is a big no-no. And they actually said that two meetings ago to, so, to us, that that was a big no-no. When we asked them if we could just get a partial determination, they said, no, we can't close anything out until we have the whole thing. So I'll leave it at that, but thank you. And anything that you would like to put into writing and send it to us, I'd appreciate it. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else here for public comment? Yeah, David, if I can speak up a little bit. Yep, Johnny, go ahead. So since I was on this river bylaw committee, uh, the, the flood district, I've been following these meetings closely to kind of see what's going on, how CONCOM would react to them. And I haven't participated in the meetings, but I've listened to them. And after watching last night's meeting, it is disheartening that Mark, you know, I've talked to him throughout the whole process. He was one of the, I think the second applicant for this whole process and to keep getting pushed back, pushed back. It does seem like there's a little extra against him here. So, you know, would appreciate the, the board looking at this, you know, a little further. Any materials that we can get in, 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 in a written form, is most helpful from anyone that wants to contribute. I'm more than happy to read everything that comes in. Hey, David. Yes. Uh, Caroline, I, we got some other formality issues. Did you get all the information to all these boards on their Zoom meetings? Because first of all, they're not even uh, doing their Zoom meetings correctly. They're not doing roll call votes. They're, they don't have a, a agenda of of the uh, people that are on the board. They're, they're just one thing after another. Did you get that information to all the boards from the state? I have not gotten that information since that since last week. No, I've, we have been focusing on the warrant and the budget, John, I apologize. I know, and Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong but have they received in the past how to run those meetings? Zoom meetings, um, I can't say if they have or if they have not. I, okay. I actually don't know. I know they weren't holding meetings for quite a while, but I do not know that. Because all that direction's in the beacon, and I read some of that stuff, and that's how, actually, that's how we ended up getting where we're at right now with our board. Uh, I had told David about it. David looked into it, and, and we're, we're running our meeting the way the state wants us to run our meetings the legal way and some of these other boards in town are, are not doing that we need to notify them and let I, th them I think all of our volunteer boards like we have and where conservation is appointed by us um, it would be our due diligence as the select board to send out a memo and the rule of how they need to run their me meetings yep. and i would like that to happen asap please absolutely you know we're we're going to get ourselves in trouble not doing what we're supposed to be doing here. Yeah, Bill, you have something? Uh, yeah I'm just going to add all uh, elected officials get um, a uh, open meeting package from the town clerk when they're sworn in. And uh -huh. I believe we have to verify it every so often that we've read it. I don't know if that extends to appointees. That's yeah. why I'm saying, Bill, I think we need to inform the people that we appoint 
that this is how they need to run their meetings. Yeah, and everything's changed with COVID and stuff like that, Bill. It's updated in that beacon, uh, you know, once a month or every couple of months. There's, there's always something the state's changing that we need to do it as a small town board, you know. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll make sure we get it out to them. But uh, I think the last one was Tony uh, Fighting. You had a comment? Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, well, first, first of all, it's not what I was here to speak on, but I'd like to throw my support um, to Mr. Britton and the people on the river. This is, you know, I spend a lot of time on the river and um, these people are not causing, causing problems. They've been, they've been doing this for years. And, um, you know, very, very few problems. And I, I'm not sure why this is happening, you know, as a town, we should, you know, not, not let our, our people be harassed whether it's by, by this board or by the Board of Health. And I, I just like to support the people on the, on the river. And uh, hopefully just let, let people enjoy the river. Um, but what I wanted to speak about briefly was uh, something that came up that I read about in today's paper. And this is an idea that seems to kind of rear its head every once in a while. That is the concept of a, uh, of a split tax rate. And this came up in, a, in an article about the budget and uh, Mr. Zidonik, a town assessor said that we may have to consider moving this way in the future due to plunging business values. And this is a, I, I want to be proactive. I know this is not on your agenda, but briefly, I think the split tax rate is a, is a terrible idea. And Mr. Zidonik, if you, um, I suggest that you um, take a ride to Pittsfield or Worcester and see how it's working out for them. See the empty storefronts and, uh, and other, other issues that they have, because although this idea sounds innocuous where you have, you know, a, a residential and commercial paying different rates and it even sounds beneficial, and it may help you get through a business uh, budgeting cycle. What inevitably happens is that that rate over over time gets wider and wider, and in um, it, it really becomes and eventually becomes a burden to businesses, and they don't invest, they don't locate there, and they don't invest in their businesses. And then, of course, the town has another budget crisis or budget crunch, and they 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 go after the businesses again, and it just gets wider. And this is not, you know, just my opinion, if you can go to these towns and it's all, and uh, you know, some towns are kind of managing it, other towns are, it's a disaster. Worcester, I'm sure would love to go back to a single rate, but they can't because it's, it's actually fiscally impossible for them to, and politically impossible for them to kind of either incrementally or you know, not go back to a, a single rate. It's just, it's not going to happen. And they're, they're, they've been suffering for years with this. And, um, well, uh and so I'm, I'm, con I'm confused, uh, uh, Mr. Fyden. Are you saying that we should look at a split rate or keep it single like we have it? I'm saying we sh should keep it single like we have it. And Mr. Zidonik oh. su suggested that we suggested that we need to look at going to a split rate. I'm very, oh. much, I'm very much against the split rate. And okay. I, and I said it's 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 caused so many problems in in communities all over the state. It seems to be gaining popularity. But that doesn't make it a good idea. And it's it's really it's, uh, you know, we're, we're here, you know, you town officials are here to make tough budgeting decisions. And when, when you, you come up with a budget and it's, I don't want to see us in a situation where we say, hey, we get a budget crisis, which is, seems like Mr. Zidonik is saying, we have to split this and get, get through this budget cycle. And then, you know, be in a, be in a really tough situation. Because when you split the rate, you know, you have to look at what's going to happen how it's going to affect our tax base in the long term, not just the budget cycle or two. And well, as I said, if you if you look if you look at towns that have done this, they are they're kind of they're in a vicious cycle where they can't they can't join the, to a single rate again. So I'm I'm against it. I know this is uh, not on your agenda now, but it's probably going to come up. And I think a lot of people in Hadley, I'm only speaking for myself, but um, bad idea. It's always been a fine line between the businesses and the taxpayers. And I, I think if we split it exactly what you said, you know, we're going to lose a lot of businesses. And then where are we going to come up with the money? The people can't afford what they're paying now in some cases. And it, it's just not going to work out. It's going to, it's going to end up being a disaster. Well, yeah. one of the, one of the reasons we kept it as a single tax base is because it brought businesses in. And the businesses that come in 
pay a lot more taxes than our homeowners do. So we're actually collecting more money from our businesses than we are from our taxpayers. So this actually keeps the taxpayers' uh, tax rate down. And I, I think it's kind of a wash in a way. And I, I certainly would not at this point entertain as my own personal feeling, but we'll have that discussion when it comes up. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, coming up soon, I believe, right? But anyways, we'll, uh, yeah, people just have to remember the only reason we have a 12-ish dollar tax rate is because of all the businesses that basically subsidize our budget and, and pay for a big chunk of our budget. You know, you got Correct. multi-million dollar buildings over by the mall there that are paying huge amounts of taxes. So just something to remember. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, thanks, Tony. Um, anybody else here? Last call for public comments before we move on. I see Dan has his hand raised. Dan. Am I not? I'm not Dan seeing. Dan had his hand raised. Oh. I don't even see Dan on my Zoom for whatever reason. Dan, if you're there. Yeah, I just want to give a quick rebuttal to that. Uh, a split tax rate doesn't generate any additional revenue for the town. We take in no additional taxes. And why I'm saying we might have to look at going to a split rate is that residential values are going up quite a bit for next year. Commercial values are going to drop quite a bit next year. So what you're going to see is that the tax burden is going to shift from commercial onto residential, where you could be looking at an additional $200 for the average house from this shift if it's not done. It's not a, a permanent thing that we need to do. But until COVID disappears and the values come back up, you can shift it back. It's not something that, that we're going to bring in more revenue. And the other communities that had it before, their discrepancy, it's always been that way for them, where residential and commercial, this goes back to two and a half in the early 80s, that residential properties had been assessed substantially lower than commercial, which is why two and a half came about. Commercial property owners sued. And the court said, you've got to bring everything up to full value. Uh, Dan, when do you usually give your, uh, your tax presentation and when do we have this discussion? I don't remember. That would be after fall town meeting, usually okay. it's early November. November, but this is right. something that I think we should discuss after this town meeting with estimated numbers to, okay. to have it take a longer period of time to look at. All right. Well then we'll add it to our list for after annual town meeting. So all right, so we'll move on from public comments. Um, let's go down to 6.1, uh, electric community electricity aggregation program. And uh, Jennifer or Carolyn, do you wanna talk about this? Actually, John O'Rourke is here to talk about that, David. All right. John, all right, your turn. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the board for allowing me to come before you tonight. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, can I share my screen? Uh, Jennifer, I'll give you permission. Jennifer, did you that. give me permission to share? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I just have a very short presentation for you. Uh, essentially, uh, we wanna talk about the renewal of the uh, community electricity aggregation. Uh, and essentially, um, for those of you, uh, just a little refresher. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, um, Massachusetts was the first um, community in the Commonwealth to pass a municipal aggregation law back in uh, 2000. Uh, and essentially what it does, it allows towns to go out to bid for their residents and businesses who are on the um, basic service of the utility. Uh, and essentially what happens is the, the supply um, bid for, and that's the, the part that's in the aggregation. The delivery is handled uh, by 
the community uh, utility, in this case, Eversource, customers get a single bill. And on that bill, uh, to, to identify there in the aggregation, it would say Hag, Had, Hadley AGG for aggregation. You can see here you have supply and delivery. The program history you launched in August, 2019. Uh, you had a very good um, uh, reception to the program at that time. And currently your supply agreement ends in November. So why are we talking about renewal now? Well, it's, we're talking about it now because we're in a very good energy market, uh, and we like to get these things done uh, when the market is good. Our analysts give us guidance on these things, and we have, uh, aside from Hadley, we have another seven aggregations going out to bid between now and the end of the month. So it's very good, good time to go out, um, and that's why we're talking about it tonight. Uh, by customer class, your residential, uh, the low income, you have 89 participants. Uh, all other residential, about 1,182 participants. Uh, small commercial and industrial, uh, 120. And large commercial industrial, three. And again, your program is, is pretty um, uh, average. You have about the same um, participation as many other communities. So uh, essentially, this is what the program has looked like. Uh, that blue line, that, that 1001, is the rate of the aggregation. That's for your standard product, which is the default product that everybody was put into when the program launched. And then you have an optional product of um, it's 12 nine, and that's for 100% renewable. Uh, you have very few participants in that. Uh, I believe it's three participants. Uh, so there isn't a lot of interest in that 100% product. That orange line is the um, uh, Eversource rates. Uh, your program started and Eversource was just slightly below. Then Eversource went up to the 11.6. Um, uh, that was during the winter, that first winter of uh, last year. Uh, then they came out with a very good rate for the summer, and you dipped below the 10-1. And essentially, the reason for that was because we went into the COVID lockdowns, um, energy demand um, weakened a bit, so they were in a very good shape um, to go out to bid, and that's why that bid came in so low. Then the winter rate for this, this um, winter 2021 uh, is 1007. And that'll go and that'll adjust again um, uh, later on. Uh, but essentially, this is the way the program looks. You can see that the, the difference between the orange line, when the orange line is above uh, the blue line, uh, it's a gain. When it's below the blue line, it's a loss. So essentially you've done pretty well here. Uh, and we expect that, uh, as I say, we'll, we'll get a very good bid uh, moving forward. Uh, proposed timeline for uh, early May. Again, we're doing the presentation tonight. Uh, we just have to uh, finalize the product options. And again, you probably should stick uh, exactly the way you are with the default at uh, no more renewable energy than is required by the state and the 100% option. Uh, you have to vote to designate a signatory to uh, sign the new electricity supply agreement. Uh, we've already gone out with the RFB, that's the, <laughs> the um, request bids. Um, we had a, originally had the schedule the, the pre-bid meeting scheduled for tomorrow, but we heard um, earlier in the week that uh, the bidders uh, are com 
competitive suppliers needed more time to do the bids. So we've shifted this out to Thursday the 20th and the bid day out to Tuesday the 25th. Uh, and again, what happens on that, that pre-bid meeting, so we get indicative pricing um, from the suppliers that bid. We talk it over with uh, town administrator and anyone on the board who wants to, to see that. Uh, make a decision on what you think would be best for the town. And again, that's a lot of that is done in pre-bid so that there are no surprises on bid day because on bid day, what happens is we get the executable prices in and we have about an hour to decide on term and price from the suppliers that bid. And essentially the way, way things have been happening now since the lockdown is that we've been doing electronic signing with um, the suppliers, which has have worked out very well. Um, what we do here, we go silent. We don't say anything about what the bid was until September. Uh, then we have education and outreach materials go out. Uh, we update the, the Hadley CEA website. We do another presentation to the board. And of course, that's recorded and people can watch that. Uh, we do education and outreach through uh, November. And it's a seamless enrollment, which means that everybody who's involved in uh, at every, any level of the program is automatically switched over to the new um, supplier. And part of that outreach is a letter to everyone who participates saying, you're participating in the program. This is the way it's been. This is how it's going to change. And it's just a simple seamless enrollment. And, and again, essentially tonight, you just have to decide on the standard option or default option and the premium 100. And as I, as I said, I really recommend that you stay with exactly what you have right now. Um, and again, um, you just need to designate a signatory for the electricity supply agreement. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Select board members, anything? Yeah, we had a bunch of complaints when it dropped down below that line. And this was uh, more of a push on to the people rather than the people involved in, in, in their bills. You know, uh, I just, there, there was a lot of people that wants to drop below, below the line that opt out of it. This was something David did and convinced us to vote for. And I don't know if it really is the best for the town right now. Just to be clear, it wasn't me, David, that did it. But <laughs> um, <laughs> No, our administrator, not our no. chairman. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I I use this program. I, I was a little um, bothered by the fact I had to opt out of it if I didn't want to enroll in it or I didn't want to use the program. The automatic enrollment uh, was an issue for me. I think it should be the opposite. If somebody wants to make a change, they should actively make the change rather than force everybody in the town to opt out of it like happened last time. Um, so I don't know if there's a way to approach that differently, but that's the only issue I had with it. Hey, David, if I could, if I could clarify that. Um, essentially, the way the law is written, it's an opt-out program. Uh, and essentially, every law that's been written in the country has been modeled on the Massachusetts law. There's really, there's, there's, when the, the law was written, uh, the, the idea was that the town would be in charge of putting this together because they figured the town was the best organizing functionary within each community. Um, and, and certainly the idea of the opt-out uh, is actually, there's a very good business case for that because uh, what happens is within that 30-day opt-out period, uh, everyone who wants to, to be in is in the program. Uh, in our programs, uh, the suppliers know that we'll get about 80 to 85% of the eligible consumers um, participating in the program. 
so they know what they're bidding on. If it was an opt-in program, they would have no idea whether it would be 80 or 85 percent or 60 percent or 40 percent or 20 percent. And quite frankly, they wouldn't bid on it. Recently, both New Hampshire and Rhode Island, who had um, aggregation laws that were opt-in laws uh, and found nothing happened in many years, just changed their laws to opt-out programs. And now they're starting to see interest from suppliers. The suppliers have to know what they're bidding on. All right. And that's the reason for the opt out. As I say, because we're a national company and our suppliers know us, we only deal with national suppliers. They know us. They have relationships with us in terms of they know when we do an aggregation, we're going to get a certain amount of those eligible uh, customers into that program. And that's extremely important to them when they're bidding because they don't have to put a lot of risk premium into uh, their bid because they know what they're dealing with. It's like anyone who, is, who has, um, runs a business that uh, answers um, requests for, for quotes. Um, if if the, the company said to you, well, we really don't know what we want, then you're not gonna bid on that because you don't know how to price that. It's the same principle here with, with these, these suppliers. And that's the, the reason for the opt-out program. And I would say that most of the, the, the um, uh, criticism we get is because of that, okay? Because people say, well, why, it's, why isn't an opt-in rather than opt-out? Because the business case is solid for an opt-out and it makes the most sense on a business level. So I have a question. What happens about new residents in town? How do they get notified about this or do they just automatically get thrown into it? Uh, no, they're not automatically put into the program. What happens is that um, probably on a three to five month basis, uh, we, get new, we get the new accounts from uh, Eversource. They'll give us that list of new uh, residents that come into a neighborhood. Uh, and we'll send them a letter and we'll say, you know, the town is in a program. Uh, if you want to want to be in it, you don't have to do anything. If you don't, you cannot. <laughs> so they are they get the same notification as those who are in the, the launch of the program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have to make a decision tonight? Uh, a decision on on what? Up, staying opt-in or do we just uh or you want us to designate somebody for the signature for the electricity supply agreement right that's that's really the only thing that you need to decide on tonight is the the to designate a signatory so just to be clear if we say yes we're going to stick with what we have which is the standard plan and designate someone to sign and go forward and uh you know we don't in the end like the bids that we get? Are we under any obligation to stick with the program or can we just say, ah, we don't like that savings, we can go back to Eversource or whatever we wanna do? Well, what, what we will do, certainly we're, we're early here and we'll go out for bid. If we don't think it's a good bid, we're not gonna, we're not gonna advise you to do anything with it. We would wait until the fall to do something or to August, okay? But as I say, we're in a very good market now. Uh, we're going out with a number of other communities and we think it's a very good time uh, to renew the contract. But that, that didn't quite answer my question. If, if, if we don't like what we see, are we obligated to continue with the program or to sign? I know you no, said- No, not, okay. not at all, okay. not at all. All right. I'd like to designate- From perspective, uh, we've, we've, never had, we've never had a town not renew. Okay. Oh. I'd like to designate our we, we, uh, we sit, town. We sit on your side of the table, okay? We, we want you to do well. And that's, you know, that's the whole point. Joyce? I, I'd like to designate our town administrator, Carolyn Brennan, to uh, sign for us on the electricity agreement. 
Yeah, I'll second that. And could we could we just a friendly amendment? Could we add that we'll stick with the standard program to that motion? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Second. Okay. So motion by Joy, second by John. Any other discussion on uh, this program? We really need to notify all the public that if they want to opt out, that they need to opt out. Because like I said, when I dropped below the line, my phone was ringing off the hook. What did you guys do to us now? Some of them weren't even aware of it. Well, you know, it, if, if I could let you know, we, we want to field all those calls. I'm not sure why they weren't referred to us. Uh, but we don't want we don't want municipal officials burdened with those calls. Uh, I'll give you my cell phone number and you get a call from anybody. You can refer them to me or you can have them email me because that's part of our job is to take care of those questions. So do you have any data that we could have that would show what our price that, through this program has averaged across the year, how much the average house pays compared to what it would have been had they stayed, say, with Eversource? I, I can get you that information. I think that would be useful. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to our, our suppliers on that. Great. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing else, Jennifer? We'll call the Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Gavitz? Yes. Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Have a good night. And we'll all right. you all so thank you. All right. Uh, we'll go to 6.2 COVID-19 update. And before I get into the vaccine policy, uh, Carolyn, do you have any operating update for town hall or anything else you want to share regarding COVID? Uh, it's going well. And we're seeing traffic, but it's been managed fine. And um, Teresa's here five days a week, nine to 12. Oh, actually, Dr. Moser's here. Dr. Moser, do you have any uh, COVID updates for uh, opening, closing, anything? You're, you're muted. You're muted, Dr. Moser. Uh, sorry. Um, no, I just got a, the weekly report. There were three cases, three positive cases in Hadley. And I know we're have, uh, one, uh, student in the schools and, um, you know, the state's reopening, uh, all the new guidelines are available on, uh, on the mass.gov website. Okay. All right. So I put, I wrote this letter. It's under vaccine policy. Um, and so anyone that can, it's in board docs for anyone that wants to read it in the public, but basically it says that the town of Hadley is not going to prohibit somebody from coming to a public meeting based on their vaccine status. Obviously we still have to finish the, or follow the governor's rules as far as masks and social distancing and whatever else. But uh, there's been some, I, I was approached by some town employees that were a little bit upset about um the idea of having to show a vaccine card in order to enter a town building when they work for the town. And uh, so I just wanted to make it clear what our policy is that we're not gonna prohibit the public from attending meetings, town meetings, using town facilities or lands or, or any basically discriminate against people because of their vaccine status. Um, in my mind, it's like anything else, you make your own personal health decisions, whether good or bad. And, uh, you know, if you make the wrong decision, you suffer the consequences, but it shouldn't be up to the town to decide that. Now, if the state comes out and says that vaccines are mandatory for certain employees, whatever, you know, it is what it is. But uh, Governor Baker, when he was asked about that, said he wasn't even going to go down that road at this point. So I'm assuming that's not going to be mandatory for, for state employees, but I just wanted to put something on record. So hopefully we can not have an issue. Yeah, David, I just had a couple of, I just uh, saw this a, a few hours ago, but I just um, uh, had a couple of, you know, just general comments that I just wanted to, to make here and then you, you, you know, all can do sure. what, you, what you would like. Um, you know, first it, it seemed to me, you know, um, 
why uh, the select board would be making this kind of a policy. In other words, it's being made from a political as opposed to a public health perspective. Um, the other, uh, one other thing was, you know, treating the circumstance around the COVID-19 vaccine, but uh, making a policy that would affect possible future vaccines. In other words, it was, it seemed pretty open-ended to me. In other words, you know, what if next year there's a new measles vaccine or some other vaccine? It, it just, it sounded to me like uh, an anti-vaccine policy. It seemed very general, you know, that it wasn't specifically regarding uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, I think in town here, we have two vulnerable populations, our seniors and our school. And, you know, they have committees uh, that are charged with making <clears throat> decisions and you know, certainly where the schools and the senior center come into play, you know, perhaps we should broaden the perspective, uh, you know, before uh, the select board goes ahead and, and, you know, make such a broad policy here. Uh, and the last thing that I would say is that, you know, fundamentally, I mean, issues of, of, of public health, um, I would seem to me should involve some kind of input from the Board of Health, uh, which is charged with keeping our, our residents as, as safe and healthy as possible, you know, before something like this would come to a vote for, for the select board. So that that that's my perspective on this. I don't really feel like it's very political. I just think it's following state guidelines and legality reasons of things you can't deny people access to publicly funded public buildings. I don't think you can do that. Um, over, a over a vaccine. Right. Yeah. The exactly. Reason that, the reason I put this on here from a, the select board standpoint is because we set our policies for our hiring policies, our building access policies, that falls on the, on the select board. Yeah, and no, I, I, I get all that. I, that. I think all of that's fine, but I'm thinking more about, you know, the school community, uh, and, uh, and our senior center, certainly, uh, you know, I, I, I have not had children in the Hadley public schools, but there are vaccinations that are required, correct? For attending school. Yeah. yeah. That's why it says, unless otherwise required by law, because there are state required vaccines. And if governor yeah. Baker comes out and says a vaccine is required at some point, or that the legislature does, then so be it. But until that happens, you don't think uh, the school committee should have some kind of input into into that or, you know, no, Dr. McKenna, you know, somebody from, from the school. No, they can bring it up to their That's board. all state mandated, no. They can bring it up to their board, but Mrs. Mosier, I don't want you to tell me I shouldn't get a flu shot or I should get a flu shot. You know what I'm saying? At this point, the CDC is not, uh, these are just emergency temporary shots that they're giving out right now that are not really proven, you know? Uh, I, I'll be the first to admit I had COVID and I'm not going to get the shot. I'll tell you right now. Can I, I make a clarification? Um, as soon as you know that I, I also work in the healthcare uh, business. And even though that I can say 99% uh, of my employees or the people that I work with have received the vaccination, we are still following uh, CDC guidelines within our office. We mask, we goggle when we come in contact with patients. Um, and I think the town does have some type of responsibility. We are not um, requiring our, uh, our, our employees uh, throughout the town to uh, require them to get the COVID vaccine. Um, it's a personal thing that people have to make that decision for themselves. Um, but we should also not uh, be able to limit them. I think it's really, we now we're getting down to the law of it all. But if we continue to follow the CDC guidelines and having people admit going into our public buildings, we don't ask everybody when they come into our town hall if they've had the vaccine or not. But we do require them to wear a mask and to uh, sanitize and wash their hands when they come in and do it when they go out and Joyce, We're still yeah, I, 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 I totally get what you're saying. I, you know, I, I'm not 
first of all, I'm not suggesting that, you know, you check people for their vaccine status before they show up for work or, you know, come to work at the town hall. I'm not, I'm not advocating for any of that. Correct. Um, but I think that's what we were faced with, Susan. I think that's where this all came about. Well, I, I, I understand that. I, I'm just, and, you know, I'm, I'm just saying that it's, it's, it seems to me that it's broader and more open-ended than perhaps it needs to be. Yes. Well, when I brought the opening plan for the senior center to the board a month and a half ago, it was very specific that we were not going to open unless people had vaccines because our population is so vulnerable and there are now so many new strains going around. And that's the process that we are currently working under. And I think the issue is that now that I guess things are open, uh, you know, we're starting to hear from members of the public that they're not happy with that. And the fact that somebody might be a taxpayer, but can't use this particular building program, you know, whatever. Um, if they actively have COVID, we don't want them to come and we're not, how do we stop that? Well, and that's true. You have, you screen people, you have them sign in, you do whatever, but that's different than asking or de requiring somebody to. It's move. not because there are so many people who have COVID with no symptoms. We have a vulnerable Hi. population. Hi, David. This is Ed. If uh, I could have a moment, I, I might be able to add a clarifying point. All right, sure. Uh, so it's, Kind of public knowledge that the EEOC has ruled that um, you know em employers can require vaccines. So then, of course, that's spilled over into certain things like towns, public bodies, and you know, of course, as a town, there's some conflicting information there because we are both an employer, but we're also a public service provider. Um, uh, it, it has not been ruled that uh, public bodies can require um, vaccines you know, for access to services. And I would, I, if I were a betting man, I would say we'd be opening ourselves up um, to a, a wide discrimination suit because, um, you know, it's, it, you know, when you talk in terms of things, even if you were to roll into health equity and, and a number of other items, you're really limiting who can access public funded services. And, you know, from a, you know, a legal standpoint, I've, I've been keeping tabs on you know, what town council's putting out there, what other towns are doing, what the state guidance is, division of local services. I really don't believe requiring a vaccine is a, is a measure that the town as a uh, political body, even though it's apolitical in terms of affiliation, but as a, as a public body, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a position the town should attempt to take. Good point. Can I please speak? Yes, Haley, go ahead. Um, so for, for those who don't know me, I'm Haley Wood. I'm the director of the Senior Center. Um, this point is very relevant for our programming and how we've been um, doing business since pa this past February. Um, the select board unanimously voted to approve the Senior Center's proposal to permit in-person recreational program um, only to people who are willing to verify full vaccination status. So that that's that is something that you did vote on and approve. Um, of course, you have the right to reverse that decision, but all of our actions and all of our programming decisions um, have been based on that decision. Um, and we have a very rich and full array of in-person programming that takes, that's based on the, I, the notion that all of those participants who are willingly um, providing information about their vaccine status are safer um, for doing so. Um, our proposal was based on a belief in science and we and I, I do believe in the efficacy of the vaccines. Um, and I believe that the reduction in our COVID numbers is a direct result of the vaccine. So I support that and I wanna state that. Um, I would have appreciated being approached about this um, proposal, um, this, policy before I learned about it very recently. Um, I just want to state that as well. Um, as we all know, there are many legal precedents for vaccines. Of course, the COVID vaccine is not yet a legal requirement, but 
it's well within keeping of, of norms that we all have been a part of all our lives that vaccines do become um, a legal requirement, for example, for attending public school. Um, if this passes, we will need to rethink all of our programming decisions and two months of work to provide um, a lot of <clears throat> in-person, um, safe, <clears throat> indoor activities um, of a recreational na nature for people. And I wanna point out that no essential service has been denied um, anyone um, based on vaccine status. It's only recreational programming for which we have attached this requirement. And I would appreciate knowing whether or not you as a board, um, as well as the Board of Health, since Dr. Mosler is here, would support our current level of in-person programming with a lifted vac vaccination requirement. Um, if you're comfortable with um, our gathering in person um, in, in small numbers and well-spaced and maintaining social distancing and wearing masks, if that feels comfortable for you, <clears throat> that would really provide me with strong guidance for making decisions going forward. Um, that's what I wanna say. So I'll, I'll let the rest of the board chime in, but uh, I will say, yes, I would be comfortable with that. I'm not asking you to cut programming. Obviously people need to be informed that of the change if they thought that it was only vaccinated people and now that's changed because that may affect who goes to those programs. Um, you mentioned that it's recreational, that no essential services are being denied. Um, I, you know, to, to me, that shows that somebody doesn't necessarily 100% you know, they're not missing out on, on something that's critical to their, their well-being or safety if it's a recreational program. So they can make that choice whether to go or not, what's best for them. I don't think we should be making that decision. Um, you know, I, this isn't arguing with science. I'm not arguing that it works or doesn't work. I, I, obviously it does. And millions of people are taking it and that's great. I but what I'm saying is from the town, we shouldn't require it. Go ahead, Amy. Do you require the people that are going to also have gotten a flu shot? No. Because the flu generally does not cause death. Oh, yes, it does. Well, it, wait, 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 wait. Uh, on, uh, on average in a year in the United States, maybe it's 40,000 deaths a year from the flu. It might be a little bit less, but I don't want to misquote. Uh -huh. This past year, we've lost 550,000 reported deaths due to COVID-19. So let's let's not compare the influenza uh -huh. virus with the uh -huh. COVID-19 virus when we're talking about morbidity and mortality. You're uh -huh. you're talking about a whole different ballgame. Uh -huh. I was just curious, but also I wanted to say that we, if we allow this to continue, we are taking away people's right to choose and we're taking away a service and we're not allowing people to be involved in things that they want to be involved with that their taxpayer dollars go to. And I agree with David that if they are afraid and they don't want to go, that is their choice to go or not to go. But if they got the vaccine and it's effective, they shouldn't discriminate against people that choose not to. Yeah, I, can I just bring up a, a, another scenario too? Is that yeah, go ahead. in the long run, if we start to open up our meetings and we go back to in-person meetings, which I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do maybe towards the fall, which I think everybody is might be looking forward to doing. Uh, well, when we do that, and we still may be under some type of CDC guidelines, uh, if we uh, have people come in and have to wear their masks, I mean. This thing is not over completely yet. Um, but the thing of it is, is that we're not going to be able to ask people if they're vaccinated or not, if they care to join our meetings. And I think this is what it's all boiling down to. Um, if we are holding a meeting and people are coming to that meeting to participate, do we actually have the right to ask them if they've been vaccinated or not, if they're one of the participants in the meeting? Um, we're kind of kind of going on a fine line here of uh, privacy, HIPAA rules, and uh, people's own rights of whether or not they care to be vaccinated. Um, so those are the things that we really need to take into consideration. Um, when we do have in-person meetings, 
um, that might be being held at the senior center? Um, do we have the right to have people say whether or not they've been vaccinated if they're not seniors? Um, so, you know, I, I'd like us to kind of iron this out. If, if we still are participating and doing what we need to do for CDC guidelines, um, I'm not exactly sure whether or not somebody is um, actually needing to tell us whether or not they've been vaccinated as long as they use the uh, proper guidelines. So we're just starting to watch this go through the court. I'm, uh, I do the travel programs and there are travel companies who are requiring people to have vaccinations before they go on their cruise or uh, you have to have a vaccination now before you can go to Europe. So the question is what the courts are going to say as this works through. And I think we should um, be really careful because if the courts say it's legal to ask for vaccines and we have stopped and somebody is affected because of that decision, then we have a different problem. Do okay. it approve the leisure activity. I'm, I'm, I want to, can I call a vote? You just need to make a motion. I move to approve the vaccine policy as written. I'll second that. Okay, motion by Amy, second by Joyce. Anybody want to have further discussion on this? Yeah, you know, your question about influenza over the past five or six years, I don't think it's been more than 30%, has it, effective? It, but the, the, they've all been approved. The difference is with this COVID shot, it hasn't been approved yet. As soon as it's approved, I have no problem asking for uh, or mandating shots for, for the public, for, the, for our employees. Here's, here's the difference that I work for Mass General. We are all mandated we are all mandated or we cannot work for Mass General unless we receive the flu vaccine. We are not mandated to receive the COVID vaccine and we all work for Mass General. So there's a little bit of differential, you know, whatever we're doing between the flu and the COVID. I would have thought that Mass General would have made all of us get a COVID since we are in direct line contact with patients and they have not done that but they did do it with the flu shot. So they said, you cannot work for us unless you get a flu vaccine. So there's a little bit of um, hesitant here on everybody following certain guidelines, but I'm, I'm in favor of us um, following CDC guidelines. And that's why I voted yes um, for us to continue on the path that we're doing and making sure that we're all, um, you know, following those guidelines, mass hand washing and as such when you uh, participate in anything. And state talking about- down, the State numbers are down and we finally had zero deaths. Okay. Yeah. Talking yeah. about man mandates, Joyce, um, I'm unfortunately mandated to pay a whole bunch of taxes in this town. And so I don't think it's fair that I'd be mandated to pay a whole bunch of taxes and then I can't walk into town hall or I can't, uh, maybe you'll shut off my water or sewer because I, you know, I, I didn't get a shot kind of thing. Or maybe I'm an employee of the town, not saying I'm, I'm not an employee of the town, but if I was and I chose not to be vaccinated that I, maybe I couldn't work in certain locations or I couldn't, you know, uh, use town vehicles. I, it, that's the problem here. And that's what needs to be clarified. I don't think that's happening anywhere. I feel like the only, I think that the only relevant scenario in the town of Hadley right now is the Hadley Senior Center. Um, we are the we are the town building that has created a vaccine requirement for involvement in in-person recreational programming. I'm not aware of any other kind of vaccine requirement that has reared its head in the town for employees or taxpayers. Well, You'd be it, setting a precedent. Yeah. It, it's also come up in town hall. It's also come up in other areas of uh, employees. 
schools. asking other people medical. Yep, the schools asking people about their, uh, you know, proof of vaccine or, or whatnot. So that's this is a policy. Just to clarify, we're not going to go down that road. If the state changes their mind and mandates it, it becomes a law. Then so be it. We don't have a choice but to follow the state law or the federal law if it becomes a federal law. But uh, it, it hasn't, and it seems like there's no desire to do so. So. Any honestly, other? I, I, honestly, I'm a wait and see kind of guy. I have not got the vaccine yet, as I told you. It, if they, they prove this and it's 100 percent like the influenza, then then I will be getting it. You know, but until that point, we're just not there yet. I don't feel personally, and a lot of people are like that. Okay. Uh, anything else from Select Board, Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? No. Chunglo? Yes. Miskevitz? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to town meeting warrant 7.1. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to, what do we need to do? Just vote on the signing the warrant? Yes, you did. You had put one article on hold until this week. And I think it was the very first one, the CPA emergency rental assistance, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so we did see a memo or a uh, bulletin or email from uh, Molly Keegan uh, in regards in reducing that uh, rental to $25,000. Um, and again, it would come out of CPA money. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. If it's not used, it stays in CPA money. Uh, but that has to be changed uh, by Randy, I believe. Um, correct? Yeah, I'll give you an update on that as well. So uh, I spoke with uh, legal and I spoke with um, Randy. And it, the agreement is, is that because CPA cannot meet before the close of the posting of the warrant, uh, Randy is going to read the article as the, the 100,000 is going to stay posted, but Randy is going to read the article as 25,000 based on a vote uh, from CPA and Amy's confident that she'll be able to pull the group together to get that pop, that uh, re reduction to 25,000. And so that that's going to avoid having to do an amendment and we'll just take up time. So that's how we're moving forward. Okay. Sounds good. Do we need a vote on that or not? You voted on each. Did you vote on each one last week? Yeah. I don't think I don't. we voted on CPA, though, did we? Or the uh, rental, did we? Well, we voted on that one. So I, the first articles are from last fall, and we had voted on all of those. Right, but we. this is a change in the number. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to make a motion to accept uh, the that uh, on town meeting that Randy Eisner be able to change that $100,000 down to $25,000. Uh, and I would accept that from the select board. Second. Okay, we have a motion, motion by Joyce, second by Amy. And uh, Sue was waving at the camera. Sue, do you have uh, something? No, it was just that you held off voting on that last week. Oh, it was. Okay. I added in my notes. Okay. Thank you. Thank God somebody's keeping notes, Susan. <laughs> yeah. Where's our minutes to our meetings? Hold as on. Let's as, do I'm this sorry. One. As soon as I have more time to get them done, John, I will. Okay. That's incredibly busy. But thank you. But let's do this one first. Uh, any other discussion on the, CP the recommendation for the CPA uh, rental assistant article? All right, Jennifer. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Wiskevitz? No. Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right. And then uh, do we need to vote to sign the warrant or is this yes? Yes. Oh. I, I just wanted to make, uh, uh, make sure uh, where I'm looking at it, but uh, to the budget 
that when we voted to change the HR was the only thing that we changed is that in the new warrant to keep that uh, twenty thousand dollars less from the finance committee. Yes. Yeah, so, so the in the in house finance team has met with Capital and um, FinCom, and so the budget that you'll be that will be coming to that we'll be putting all the numbers in uh, that will be placed on the warrant is the set is does include the HR being restored to full time. Okay, thank you. I'll make a motion to accept the uh, articles as they are for town meeting. Second. And to close the one. All right. Jennifer, you, you look confused. Do we need a motion to post the warrant or sign the warrant? What, what? Motion to sign the warrant. Make a motion to sign the warrant then. Thank you. Thank you. Second. All right. So motion by Joyce, second by John. Any other discussion on the warrant? Nope. Carolyn's probably happy to get this done and over with finally. I'll be happy tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did vote. We did vote on the uh, finance committee's uh, requests anyway last week, didn't we? We did except for the HR and we voted yes on that. Yeah, we did. They, they hadn't voted on the whole warrant and budget until today. Okay. Okay. Do we need to do the distribution of our articles? Yes, you do. Can we, can we do the, can we take the vote first though, please? Yeah, well, <laughs> sorry, Jim. Trying to move along. <laughs> Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Ms. Gevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Okay, Joyce, move on. <laughs> could we make mo uh, could we uh, divvy up the uh, articles? Oh, who's going to speak to them? Yep. Sure. Let's find the list here. I think we I go think down to that last week. Stretch Energy Code was the first one on uh, town meeting that we was left over. Uh, yep, because we have CPA for the first two, planning board for the next two. So number five, Stretch Energy Code. We would, did Tommy speak about that, or was that Christian last time that talked about that? Tommy. It was Tim. 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 Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> we'll let we'll let. Uh, uh, Tommy as building inspector talk about it because that way he can answer any questions about what it means, I think. That can sounds good. Somebody from that committee also be available to talk if there are further questions. Um, yes, I believe Jack Sakowski will be available and also Mark Radinsky, who is uh, the gentleman who presented last time and he's actually um, planning on attending the public forum as well, but I believe he's planning on attending um, for questions as well. Sounds good. All right, so we'll skip that one for the select board. Uh, six, <laughs> grants and gifts. That's usually, um, uh, David always spoke about that, but Carolyn, do, do you want to talk about that or Linda as far as uh, how the grants and gifts work? So if that's a consent agenda, and this is just education for me, do you do each consent agenda separately as a presentation? Actually, do no, we don't. Okay. <laughs> Because I can, I can talk about the consent agenda uh, because I, Revolving Account is usually a consent agenda as well. And I'm going to be talking about that, why, it's, why I took it out of consent agenda. Yeah, they usually, we, usually, we usually read it off. And then if there's something that needs to be pulled by the public, then we'll pull it out and vote on it separately. So, Carolyn, you can have the whole consent agenda then. I'll <laughs> and if you do it right, there won't be any questions. That's right. There we go. All right. So then we'll move down to number 12. Uh, that's the, you're going to take care of that one as well? Yes. And the, the only change there is I just, I added to that motion because we are taking out um, the, the electrical uh, inspections, the Russell School and the after school program because they're not, they're, they're no longer functioning and we're returning that to the general fund. Okay. 
So are you saying that seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven or ten are uh, all consent agenda? Yep, six through eleven are consent. Okay, so th those are all yours. Yay! That, that's consent Thank you. for return, right? Uh, for yes. revolving, revolving fund, John, or yeah, that's all consent for returns. We so have two separate consent agendas. The budget would be the first one. And then these articles would be returns, correct? I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean by returns. Uh, balances, balance it's, returns. Uh, well, the revolving account is yeah. regarding um, what is allowed to be spent out of those funds. It's not a balance, but we can okay. have those balances available if you'd like them. All right. The rest of the consent are just, they're not controversial and you guys, you, it's kind of standard. You have it at every, um, at every annual town meeting. Yeah, as long as the balances are there, they're going to be written in anyway, so. All right. Or the amounts. John, how about you taking the revolving fund? <laughs> All right. We've never yeah. done that before. No? We've never yeah. put the, the balances in the revolving account. It's always been uh, what's allowed to... Uh, run through the revolving account. Yeah, there was X amount of dollars to be spent every time. Yeah, right. I'm just going to do the balances of the accounts uh, that we're going to be returning. Yeah. That, that's but you'll what, know what's going back into the general fund. I wasn't going to do the balances of all of them. That's what I meant by the returns. There are returns on each. Okay, account. gotcha. Thank you. All right, so is okay. John taking 12? Is that what's happening? If you know what I'm talking about, then you can do it, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> all right so john you have 12 sure all right uh i'll take 13 unless anybody else wants it that's yours dpw 14 we have a the levy assessment study i, I think the gentleman from the engineering firm is going to be there maybe carolyn you'd probably be best to talk about this yeah mm -hmm. okay. have, have um somehow vote we can vote to have them at the beginning, right? That's part of Randy's start that lets people who have pertinent information, even if they're not town residents, speak. He does that per, whenever the article comes up, uh, he, he will say so-and-so will speak to this, even though they're not a town resident. Okay. We just need to let Randy know that ahead of time. Yeah, yep. I think the floor votes to accept him to speak. Yeah. All right. So then we have uh, the general fund, 15 general fund budget. That usually is the finance committee and then anything other questions, uh, then we would follow up on that. Okay. Good enough for me. Uh, enterprise fund budgets. So what's, what's going on with that? That's water, sewer, and what else? Cable, maybe Hadley Media. Hadley Media. All right, Carolyn, do you want to do that one since you'll? Yep. Okay. Uh, 17 Capital. I'm, I'm sorry, who's doing 16? David. Uh, you know, Carolyn's doing 16. No, that's Enterprise Fund. You said you were doing that. No, no. I was that's doing water, that's water, sewer, and cable yeah. you, you said yes oh okay sure it's yours all right <laughs> i think you just yeah. talked me into it somehow but okay <laughs> absolutely to be clear david you are doing article 16 okay no that was a question david you are doing article 16 yes i will thank you <laughs> okay this is a rough one tonight <laughs> Uh, all right, 17 is a capital item. So uh, I think Paul Makretsky will be there. He's our, our new chair of the capital committee. So I will ask him if he's willing to speak to these. Okay. Uh, if not, then I could take it or, or Carolyn could take it, I guess. If, if you wouldn't mind, if you would, um, and to, if I'm out of line, let me know. If, if you would let Chris and I do that together. Yeah, we've great. been working really closely together on that. And I think uh, it gets complicated. Okay. Okay. 
Um, 18 is the capital ambulance purchase. I will let Chief Spanknebel talk about that one, I think. He'd be the best one. I'd like to chime in on that, please. Certainly. So how about Joyce and Spanky? There you go. <laughs> Who's laughing? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll mute. <laughs> Only Joyce can get away with that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 19 is CPA project extensions. That would be CPA. Yep. Actually, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 19 to 24. Is that all CPA? Uh, what's the, uh, no, ConCom, you got you, Grulinski and uh, Hendrick oh, yeah. Properties. Okay. I'll Amy, do Amy, well, Amy may be willing to Amy, um, speak on that. Amy, uh, that's how she did it tonight. She presented both for converse, conservation and CPA because it just was confusing if you had two different people talking about it. I don't know yeah. if I'm throwing that out there. Yeah, Amy's good. Okay, so 19 to 24, we'll say Amy or possibly conservation if they really want to talk about it. Uh, 25, that is planning board, so we don't need to worry about that. 26. Uh, I Jane. That one. Yep, Jane can do that one. How about 27, the moderator? I know we let Randy talk about it. Okay. And 28, parking ban. I'll take, like Mason. I'll, I'll take it. All right, Joyce and Chief Mason. Joyce and Chief. Yep. Joyce and the Chiefs, this is a new band. Yeah. <laughs> it's my boys. All right. That's it, I think. Excuse me. Can I just ask uh, 13, who is doing the DPW projects? David Hill. That was David. Me. Oh. Okay. John is out on this. John got in there on the first part. Okay. Lynn, Linda's waving her hand. Um, yeah. 16, the enterprise fund budget. That's a budget article. Finance committee should do that too. 16. Yes. 15 uh, and 16. They used to be just one budget article, but it got split to general fund and enterprise. That, that's uh, that's finance committee. All right. Thank you, Linda, for saving me. <laughs> you can find something else to do, David, I'm sure. <laughs> We'll find him something else to do. No problem. That's walls available in case you want it. <laughs> the public likes to hear from you, John. Yep. Yeah, uh, sometimes. <laughs> All right. Um, Carolyn, anything else on the warrant? I don't think so. All right. The so select board just has to stop by Jennifer's office and sign as soon as possible. Yes, and if you're okay, it might just be the last page because Susan and I are going to hunker down tomorrow and go line item by line item, um, and it just so we can get it to Jessica. So, do you trust me? <laughs> if it's we, just the last page, yeah. we trust God. We trust Him. Okay. <laughs> so I need to see all of your smiley, happy faces before four tomorrow, but I really would like to see you by three o'clock at the very latest. Okay. Boy. Don't get out till three. I'll be waiting for you at three ten. I got a meeting with a library at two, so it's gonna be close. Can I do like a virtual signature? Mm, when are you leaving for the airport? Uh, as soon as this meeting is over. I'll meet you as you're driving by the door. I'll be standing outside the building waiting for you. Are you really? Yes, I will, because it's a it's a warrant okay. and it needs a real signature. Yes. I can sign it on my way out of town. I will be literally waiting for you at the side of the building. Don't hit me. <laughs> okay. Well, or can my she mom, could just can she come in? <laughs> if like, Amy, if, uh, he's flying to Texas. Yeehaw. Oh, you, have your, you have your key. She can she can always leave it for you. That's what I was gonna say. Just oh, okay. so you don't have Why to wait you for leave it downstairs for. Her? On the table where everybody signs in, and then Sue, who gets in at the crack of dawn, can pick it up. I'll call Amy when we're done and work it out. All right. Lovely. Thank you. All right. 
Okay, uh, next we're gonna go to 8.1 use of the town commons. And this is a council on aging event, I believe. So uh, Jane or if Haley's here would like to talk about that. I'm happy to speak about it. Um, this would be the second time that we've used the town common during COVID. Um, it's for Friday, May 21st with a rain date of the 28th. Um, we would use the north end of the south south of Route 9 Common under the trees. Um, at noontime for an hour and a half, we put up two uh, 10 by 10 pop-up tents and we have musicians play and um, people come and bring their chairs and sit appropriately distanced. Sounds like a good event. It's fun. Last year we had about 30 people and it was, it was like something that was going on in COVID in June and you know, seniors really shouldn't be locked up in their homes. It's bad for their health. So this is a good thing to get them out and it's out in the fresh air. Yeah, motion to approve, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Can we get a second? Second. <laughs> sure, second. Yeah. All God, right. Did everybody go to sleep? Yeah, Joyce and second by John and Jennifer, You did you have something to say too? I was just going to let you know that even though their signatures aren't there, um, police, fire, and DPW all approved it today. Um, they just did it after I posted it. So, but everybody's approved it. All Great. right. Roll call vote, please. Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Tungalo? Yes. Skevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, last item I see is the town administrator report. Carolyn, is there anything you wanna hit that you didn't cover already? Yeah, I'll let you know that uh, the buyers for North Hadley Village Hall have signed the purchase and sales agreement and that is here for your signatures as well. Uh, I'm just gonna give you some dates, just a reminder that the real estate taxes were due on May 3rd um, and the demands will be issued on May 17th. The high school graduation is May 28th at 6 p.m. The Hadley Mothers Club has recycling on May 15th, as well as the Hadley cleanup by the Climate Change Committee. And there's more info about that on the website. And Jane, I don't wanna steal your thunder. Uh, I was gonna mention the veterans drive by on the 28th. Okay, so the Senior Center has sent out invitations today to 194 Hadley residents who are veterans they're not necessarily all seniors, um, to drive by on the 28th at one o'clock past the senior center. We're going to have coffee and donuts to go just to thank them for their services since we can't do parades this year. Um, and we've, we've done other things like this. And last year we had a program for them and we had about 50 of the veterans actually show up. So that's really exciting to know that they care and that they know that we care. Also, um, Senator Comerford and Representative Kerry will be there as well as our town administrator and the uh, Veterans Service out of Northampton will be there and they'll be handing out information that would be useful to veterans that they might not otherwise have. And can we just say that there's going to be a change in our uh, Memorial Day that actually we will be going to the cemeteries on Memorial Day, which we always have done it on Sunday. Uh, we will be doing it on a Monday and the board did approve a bus uh, for our veterans to go to the cemeteries. And I believe that our fire department was going to be doing uh, their color guard is also, as I think was what Mike had said, um, so just a reminder that our remembrances will be on Memorial Day itself and not on Sunday. So that was a little bit of a change. Um, we did does, not actually. Does the select board go to that as a group? We usually have participated in all the cemeteries. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I've done it now for how about 31 years because I did it was on school committee. So, yep. Um, so anyway, I'd like to continue that practice. And uh, we have not said anything. I think there will be a representative to the, um, Mike is planning on sending a fire truck number one to Hatfield. 
on uh, Sunday where they have their parade and their parade over there is just going to be a drive, drive around. It's not going to be any marching or anything of that sort. So I believe, I don't know if any select board were planning on doing that. I, I haven't really committed to it. I don't know if anybody else has um, to participate in the Hatfield parade, which is on Sunday. Are, are the police going to send a cruiser over there too? Um, I imagine they will. I will talk to Mike about that just so he can co coordinate it with um, Mike Spank and Abel. Yeah, all right. Be nice if both of them went over. Yeah. Um, other than that, I think that's all I had for the Memorial Day thing. Okay, I and would like. It, it, it'll be two p.m. at the what is normally done. It will be two p.m. Uh, at the uh, Legion on the afternoon for the raising of the flag and the uh, uh, fire salute. I would like to add to Carolyn's comment about uh, Hadley Cleanup Day, which the um, Climate Change Committee is sponsoring at the same time that the Mother's Club is doing their recycling at the elementary school. Um, if you, you need to sign up in advance, to clean up an area of town. We're not talking about your own front yard. Um, and you will get, tr given that you sign up in advance and go to Home Depot, you will get trash bags and gloves donated by Home Depot, tandem bagels, donating bagels for people who are doing the work. And it's so far there are about 40 people who have signed up to help clean up our town. This is a really great opportunity for you to do something simple and make our town look good. Sounds good. And Carolyn, was that it for your, we kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. just want to make sure we didn't uh, leave anything off there. Any other announcements? Mm -hmm. uh, we are not having the executive session tonight, correct? We don't need to. Okay. And did you have, what? what's the plans for next week? Do we all have to participate in that or not? Are we going to have the hearing on the mosquitoes next week? No, next week is not for it's, any other thing, but the... Yeah, it is. Wait. No. Jennifer? The public forum is on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. In the past, we have taken up, taken up other items than just the um warrant um so seeing how there was not time for something to be put on tonight i don't see why we could not follow past practices and put on something that was on in the past um i will say that there's more to the mosquito discussion than there is first presented but um i, I will say that past practices has been that y'all have taken up other items appointing people taking votes the other things other business have been conducted at public forums because it is a legally posted select board meeting. I want, I want to know how the agenda is going to proceed next week. Yeah, I, I think the mosquito thing is going to be a whole separate issue. It's going to take quite a bit of time. Yeah, I do too. It's, it is, there's a deadline for a decision about opting out. Well, I plan to opt oh, can't we, do we, can we have a discussion about it right now? It hasn't been posted. It's other. It comes under other. Um, with this type of, uh, Joyce, just to protect you guys, with this type of discussion, I think you're better off to have it posted and have people be able to see it, uh, to be able to watch it. Yeah. So we could either have it after the forum or before the forum. I mean, we could start at six and do the mosquito thing in the forum at seven. And just to be clear, it's not a public hearing. It's, yes. it's the select board only. We're not going to have 10,000 residents making comments and whatever else. It's going to be our discussion. And it's a select board decision. If you, if you would like to do it not at six, it's not going to take that long. I would be willing to do a 630 on the mosquito thing and then go for the, um, the other one for seven. I will, I will set the agenda up that way. So wait, so you're starting later? 6.30 for the mosquito and seven o'clock 
wasn't that the time we were going to do for the uh, open forum or were you going to go earlier, Carolyn? I thought it was, I thought it was six. Why am I thinking it was six now? We can do six. Meetings were changed to six o'clock. Public forums historically in the past have always been at 7 p.m. to allow people to get to the forums um, after dinner. It will be a virtual, but you know, if y'all want to change it, it's it's a matter of changing the Zoom thing. I don't have to change a reservation or anything. Um, I was going with what historically had been done. Is that good for everybody? 6.30 for other business and then seven for the public forum? I'm concerned that we're not going to have time for public comment on that major conversation that's concerning mosquitoes. The amount of conversation that I've gotten today. Jane, it's not a public forum on, on mosquitoes, so we don't have time it's to do that. not a forum on mosquitoes, but there are people who should be heard. They are town residents and taxpayers, as you point out. I think we have to let some up. Maybe we put the time limit on them, but I think we need to let some people speak. I know the Board of Health has taken a position on this. They should be allowed to speak. I think the a half an hour is a sufficient amount of time for any topic. Agree. Okay. So, all right, 6.30 for other business and seven o'clock for the public forum. So all right. moved. All right. Second. Thanks. Anything else? Nope. All right, yep. can I get a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn. Second. And a second by Amy and Jennifer. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Miskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Have a good night, all. Good night, everyone.